Welcome back to the State of Latino America 2021 brought to you by LULAC. Now we introduce you to our policy fireside chat, an opportunity for a close-up conversation. And guiding us there will be our national chief executive officer, Cindy Benavides, and her guest involved in the Federal Communications Committee. Cindy. Bienvenidos a todos, good, and good afternoon, good morning to everyone. My name is Cindy Benavides. I serve as the national CEO of LULAC, and we are extremely excited today to have acting chairwoman of the FCC, Jessica Rosenworcel. And so thank you so much uh, for being with us. This is going to be such a, a great fireside chat um, and dialogue, just understanding one, what lies ahead and also some of the work uh, that we as community members can do uh, to make sure we're advancing this issue. So uh, Acting Chairwoman, thank you for being with us this morning, this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to join you. No, thank you. And I wanted to ask you as, you know, we're looking at the Federal Communications Committee and you were just recently appointed by President Biden in general, what is the mission of the FCC? And, and also the, what's on top of mind for everyone is how in the next coming years, what steps you're going to take to close the digital divide? Yeah, um, it's good to start with the basic question. So uh, the Federal Communications Commission has been around since 1934. And today it oversees all kinds of communication in this country. So that's your broadcasting television, that's your broadband, that's satellite, radio, television, you know, all the things we use every day to stay connected. And frankly, things that during this pandemic, we are using just to keep up some semblance of modern life. And the way I see it is that the mission of the FCC in these times is to make sure everyone in this country, no matter who they are, where they came from or where they live has access to modern communications. Because I think if you do, you have a fair shot of success in the 21st century. And that's really my priority at the agency, not just to address the digital divide, but to say 100% of us need access to modern communications. And we are gonna have to figure out ways to get it to everyone everywhere. Thank you for that. And, and we know that you know, COVID-19 um, has hit so many across America, across the globe. And as a Latino civil rights organization, we're absolutely looking at the impact in the Latino community. We know that already so many of our students are receiving Fs. We know that one in three Latinos do not have access to technology or broadband. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, Acting Chairwoman, as the FCC works to stand up the emergency broadband benefit, what steps are you taking to ensure that those who need it the most have access to it? And as we think of this pandemic, what do you think are some of those long-term challenges that we need to keep an eye on to be able to address? Yeah, those are big questions. Um, let me start with something that's obvious, which is just this pandemic has exposed that our nation's digital divide is very real and very big. And it doesn't affect all communities equally. We have um, a lot of folks who are struggling right now with the economy. We have folks in rural areas and urban areas who don't have access to the internet. And we gotta figure out how to get everyone connected. Again, 100% of us. So we have a few initiatives in my first few days that we have begun. And the first is something called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, what you mentioned. Because late last year, Congress tasked the FCC with setting up a program to make sure households that are struggling can afford broadband. And that's a $50 a month benefit for low-income households to help get them connected. Our goal now is to have those rules in place for that program by the end of this month. And I'm very excited about it because this nation has never had as big of a program to help get low-income households connected. And then there's a second thing we're doing, which I call solving the homework gap. And really the best way to describe that is maybe point out this. 
Maybe you saw it earlier this year. There was this viral picture of these two girls in Salinas, California, these young girls sitting outside a Taco Bell on the cold cement with what looked like, you know, school issued laptops. And they weren't sitting outside the restaurant for lunch, right? They were sitting there because it was the only place they had to get the signal they knew they needed to go to online class. And here we are, millions of students are locked out of the virtual classroom because they don't have a reliable internet connection at home. In fact, there's studies that show it's 17 million kids in the United States and one in three black, Latino, American Indian or native Alaskan students. In other words, the homework gap this thing that where you don't have an internet connection at home, though you might have it in the school, is part of a larger education gap we're gonna see. If we don't figure out how to get these kids back into the classroom and get the connections they need just to do their nightly schoolwork. And the way I see it is we used to have no child left behind. I wanna have no child left offline. And we're gonna try to solve the homework gap at the FCC by using a program that's been in place for decades called E-Rate, which helps connect our classrooms to the internet. Now we gotta figure out how to also use that program to connect kids at home, solve the homework gap by doing things like allowing our school libraries to loan out wireless hotspots and finding ways to blanket our students' homes with broadband. The bottom line is 17 million kids deserve to be connected and it disproportionately affects the community you work with We've got to make it a national priority to close this homework gap. And I'm proud that the FCC in just a few days is already on it. We are working with school associations and educators across the country to see how we can change this program and reach every child and get them the connection they need for their education. You know, I, I, I feel um, Jessica just so out of work because it's, it's so needed, and we know personally so many families who are being impacted, not only in the Latino community, but also in our African-American community, yeah. in our Native American communities, and so many parents who are struggling just to survive and really, you know, put those basic needs before their children. In fact, we were talking with health professionals, doctors who work in the emergency rooms, clinics, and they were mentioning that some of the first questions they get asked is what resources are available for food insecurity and financial insecurity. And then maybe the question of the vaccine comes up. And so certainly, you know, parents are, I know that there's so much happening at this moment and that everyone is, is trying to just figure out, you know, what comes next. Uh, but I just commend you acting chairwoman that just in a matter of days we're we're seeing change and that this change will create an impact in our communities that I think will benefit so many. And, and the fact is that so many of us know of children and have seen children who have sat outside of Dunkin' Donuts or Taco Bell or mm -hmm. McDonald's because they don't have that Wi-Fi, that connection at home. And so, you know, it certainly, it, it, I, I, I will tell you, it warms my heart to know that we have individuals who absolutely know that this is top priority for us because we cannot afford for our children to fail in school. In school. Um, so thank you, Chairwoman. I agree, amen to that. We can't let this homework gap become a long-term education and learning gap because that's gonna have economic consequences that won't just be borne by that child or that student. They'll be shared by all of us. So we have to invest in solving this problem right here and now. Absolutely. We're gonna shift a little bit. And as you may be aware, LULAC has been working really diligently on the issue of representation. Um, you know, many folks know we are 92 years young and we are the oldest and largest national Latino civil rights organization in the country. And for 92 years, you know, our core mission has been to protect and defend while trying to advance the different issues that impact the community. And one of those issues is the issue of representation. We're absolutely glad to see that uh, President Biden has absolutely taken um, really bold steps to ensure that there's representation at the cabinet level as well as within the agencies. And I wanted to ask you, Acting Chairwoman, 
you know, how will you play a hand or a role in making sure that the FCC represents the community that it serves across the country? Yeah, you know, I think sometimes the best way to describe this is frankly, talk about your own lived experience. I'm the only woman serving on the FCC. In 86 years, there's never been a permanent chair of the agency who's female. Um, I'm the only mom who's been in this role. And I think those things make you conscious of when you walk into a room. First thing I ask myself, is there diversity at the table? Because we know when we have diversity at the table, we make better policy decisions. We see better outcomes. We do better by our culture and our economy. And so that's front of mind in everything I do. And I will tell you, right as I took over the agency, one of my first tasks was figuring out who's going to come in and help me. And I went into the Office of Workplace Diversity and I said, you know, you're no longer going to just sit in a corner and do good work. You're going to report directly up to me because we got to make this a priority. We need to have a pipeline and internships and opportunities and people who are promoted right here, right now. And I also did the same with the Office of Communications Business Opportunities that reaches out to small businesses and um, minority entities to figure out how to get them involved in communications and said the same thing. I want you reporting straight up to me because I want to start integrating those efforts in everything the agency does. Because in the end, I think the agency and our communications economy is more powerful if it looks like all of us. Completely agree and, and couldn't agree uh, further. Um, you know, LULAC sits on the Diversity Council for the FCC, addressing, in fact, the digital divide. And I wanted to ask you, because we, we see this issue come up, you know, often it's also the lack of representation of Latinos in broadcast media. And I'm wondering, you know, what are some of the steps? And I realize, you know, you're two weeks in. Um, there's still a lot of planning to do. We, we, we have four years ahead. But as you're thinking of the future, you know, what are some things that come top of mind as we continue in this thread of representation, but also within broadcast media? That's a really good point because, you know, media ownership matters. It says a lot about who we are as individuals, as a community, as a nation. And when ownership reflects who we are, I think you see different stories, different news. And right now, when you look at the data, it's like uh, with respect to full power television stations, about 5% are owned by women. When you look at uh, the same data for Latinos and Hispanic uh, ownership, it's about 4%. That doesn't look like the, the, the world that we live in. And it has you know, real consequences. What do you hear about on the news? What information do you get? Whose stories are told? You know, why when you look on the screen is one population often just depicted as um, the hot lady with an accent or gunman number two, right? We got to figure out how to fix this. Now, there's some challenges here. There's a case in front of the Supreme Court right now called Prometheus that speaks directly to how much the FCC can look into diversity when it thinks about spectrum licenses for broadcasting. And I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you what's going to happen with that. But I can tell you there have also been some really important initiatives in Congress that I'd love to see move over the finish line. For instance, um, Senator Menendez has repeatedly introduced something called the Minority Tax Certificate Program. Sounds technical, but really at bottom, it's about access to capital. Because if you don't have access to capital, you can't participate in markets where those stations are being bought and sold. And if you can't participate in those markets, you're not going to participate in the development of programming. And so um, that's something I hope we can return to, because I think that access to capital point is the most important one here and the one most likely to create change. And we do need some change. Thank you for that. We are following this very closely and you know, we're able to work with the National Hispanic Foundation of the Arts and many other organizations around this issue. And certainly, you know, unfortunately, oftentimes our community is stereotyped or put into certain roles. And not only that, but we are obviously looking at ownership and 
Um, access to capital is a real issue. You know, as we talk to individuals who want to break into this industry or even who want to produce a film or movie, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we certainly will be tracking this and keeping an eye, um, acting chairwoman. I wanted to also ask you, and you know, this is going back a little bit to COVID-19 and how this has impacted communities of color. Um, but I know that the FCC received additional funding to expand telehealth to provide remote access to medical services during the pandemic. And I wanted to ask, is the telehealth program working? And if in it in what changes, if you're already seeing what changes need to be addressed, I can certainly tell you that for LULAC, the issue of rural broadband is actually a top priority mm -hmm. because yeah, a lot of individuals don't know that we have over a thousand uh, communities in, uh, in rural America that are predominantly Latino. And for us, this issue of accessing, again, resources, and especially through the pandemic, the issue of telehealth is one that is also very much present for us. And so I wanted to, again, ask, you know, how is this program working and, you know, how is it addressing the issues that are impacting our community, communities of color, specifically our Latino community? Yeah, during this crisis, telehealth has not just expanded, it's exploded, right? Because we've started to recognize that there might be safer ways to interact with healthcare providers instead of actually physically showing up. And because there've been changes in reimbursement, Healthcare providers have embraced it too. Of course, it depends on everyone having that connection, which is so important. But I also want to tell you that in the last week or two, I visited with a uh, Whitman Walker clinic in Washington, a low income healthcare clinic. I also visited with Children's Hospital in Washington. And I've spoken to the experts in telemedicine at the University of Virginia because I felt like, why don't I ask them what's happening on the front lines as you? navigate this pandemic and the FCC can give out dollars to healthcare institutions to help with telemedicine, what are you learning? And one of the best stories I heard was about work that they're doing with populations where English is not the primary language. And that during COVID days, it might be necessary to only have one person show up for that appointment. But if they can do it remotely, there might be someone sitting next to them who can not only translate, but write down with total precision what the advice is from their healthcare provider. And that when it comes to populations who do not use English as their primary language, telemedicine and talking to people at home, even with things like behavioral therapy can make people more comfortable, more accessible and get them better healthcare and better outcomes. And so it's like this wonderful demonstration project of the good that telemedicine can do, but this challenge is real, which is we've got to connect everyone because we don't want the limits of their healthcare to be the limits of their bandwidth. I'm going to have to quote you on a couple of things that you said in the future, <laughs> okay. um, because it's, it's so absolutely true. And, and I will tell you yesterday, I, I was specifically um, connecting with a company that's working um, across different communities and what they're doing is uh, partnering with the health department so that if there's a language that the person in front of them does not understand, they can call this service. And then they have someone that speaks, for example, an indigenous mm -hmm. language from Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like I know that, you know, at times it's just trying to figure out how can we use technology to be able to make that connection, especially right now, as we see the rollout of the vaccines and making sure yeah. that all communities are able to access that, I know it will be terribly important. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to pivot a little bit and just dedicate the next three minutes, um, acting chairwoman, to a little bit of understanding who you are on a personal note. But I know we have so many individuals who are students in college, who are young professionals, who may be wondering, you know, how do I get into government? And I'm just wondering, um, Jessica, what led you to public service and why, why this role? Oh, such a good question. Um, you know, I like to think that public service runs in my family. Um, my uh, father was uh, served in the Air Force and then went on to run a uh, 
hypertension clinic for low income individuals in the city of Hartford. My mother also helped for two decades running a soup kitchen there. Um, my grandfather before them served in the United States Customs Service. And um, my great grandfather before that who was an immigrant, uh, he was a public servant too. He, he was a janitor who swept the streets of New York. So um, I think public service is a terrific calling. And if there are young people out there who wanna get into making our world better and more inclusive, please get involved, please do it. There's room for you at the table because we need your ideas because we've got problems to solve. And I'm actually optimistic that the next generation is gonna help us do it. I, you know, I, I, I can connect to that story so much. Um, acting chairwoman, being an immigrant myself, having come from Honduras and um, you know, and you know, when we first arrived in Los Angeles, picked up cans in the streets of Los Angeles with my mom because that was the fun activity we had on the weekend, and cleaned houses um, to be able to you know help the family and also uh, through college be able to have income through college. And so um, know that we understand those journeys and that we've lived those journeys as well. And so many of our audience members are you know right now. Uh, supporting their families, family members who maybe are unemployed or were furloughed without pay. And so certainly we know that, you know, for us, it's one, an honor to have you as the acting chairwoman at the FCC because of your long track record and everything that we've seen you do throughout the years. I wanted to end it with um, what would be maybe three pieces of advice that you would give you know, to our audience again, and it's a mixed audience. We have LULAC members from across 41 states, Washington DC and Puerto Rico. We have students from across college campuses. We have young professionals who are looking to charter their career path. And so as you, know, you come into this role and, and you reflect on your journey, what would be perhaps three pieces of advice that you would give us? Uh. Okay, um, the first is ask for permission less. If you wanna get things done, sometimes you're gonna have to move ahead. I acknowledge you might get yourself in trouble, but asking for permission less is one way to move the ball forward. I also think that when everyone is out there searching for sponsors and mentors and people who can help them, I think always remember you can do that for people behind you too. Decide you, yourself, if you've reached any point in your professional life, you too can be a sponsor or a mentor and make space to bring someone else along. And then I always love this piece of advice from Shirley Chisholm, who um, iconic, ran for president, uh, you know, just total dynamo. But she said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. I repeat that to people all the time because um, I think that's how you get things done. Not everyone's gonna give you a seat in the chair at the table, so you bring a folding chair. Those are words to live by. Thank you so much, Acting Chairwoman, again, for making time today to join us to have this really important dialogue and conversation. And know that I will also take those pieces of advice to heart. <laughs> Um, and have been in positions where I've had to bring my own folding chair and or stand next to the table when I didn't have one. I um, love it. We can make like a folding chair army because that's how we're going to get things done. Absolutely. Mil gracias. Thank you again. You heard it directly from our acting FCC commissioner, and we can't wait to work with you in the years ahead. Gracias. Thank you, Lulac.